Good morning, all of you. I'm glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. My wife, who is a teacher, if you didn't know that, told me that she really liked the use of the whiteboard last week. So I'm going to keep that up. Um, it doesn't take a scientist to know that the more you involve your senses in the learning process, the more likely you are to retain something. So you see something, that's one sense. You, you take it in in the written form. You take it in by your hearing. And then you can go even one farther if you want. I challenge you to take notes. Because when you involve your, your feeling of touch, that's just another sense that you are indulging with your body uh, in the learning process. And the more likely you are to retain it. Now, the reason I encourage you to do that, because we're going to talk about the Word of God, and there's nothing more in this world that we should try to retain than God's Word. Uh, over and over and over in Scripture, we're commanded to meditate on it, to study it, to apply it to our lives. And if we don't know God's Word, if we don't have that foundation, we can't do those things. So we're going to continue in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, we are at verse 11. But I'm going to read the section that we're working on right now, which is verses 6 through verse 17. And Paul, again, he's, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, providing them with some very uh, poignant application. Uh, in the first three chapters, it was all about doctrine, all about teaching. Now he's saying, okay, here's what I've taught you. This is how you apply it to your lives. And he's going to start right out of the gate in verse 6 with the command. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Another command. For at one time you were darkness. We talked about that last week. But now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That's where we left off last week. In verse 11, he's going to give a very, very strong command. It's a negative, um, I can't even remember the, the Greek uh, verbiage for that. But it's a, it's a very strong command in the present tense, a continuous command for us. It says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, okay? For it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. Obviously, he's implying those people who are doing unfruitful works in darkness. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, but not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay, let's go back to verse 11 and define some terms. First of all, the first term that came out to me that's very strong is this word unfruitful. Um, it is in contrast to what we studied last week, being fruit of the light. Okay, so before salvation, we were unfruitful. The contrast after salvation is we are fruit of the light. We always have to remember that light is Jesus. And we went over several verses talking about how Jesus says, I am the light. I am the way. I am the life. He is the light. And through him, we are now the fruit of light. Fruit of light is in contrast to those works in darkness that are unfruitful. Okay? What is basically works of darkness? Anybody have any idea? 
Simple little word that really gets only used in church. Sin. Sin. Okay? The opposite of, of what is good, true, and right then is sin. And I know this is all simplistic, but we don't want to take it for granted because... Before salvation, we were stuck being unfruitful. We were stuck in sin. Regardless of what, what we thought was good, true, and right, we didn't have the foundation that we needed to understand and be, be fruit of light. Again, the question, how many good people do you know that are going to hell? I know tons, and I know you do too. Good people that do not know Jesus Christ, that do not have the foundation of the truth of what is good, of what is right. And Paul goes on to say, but instead expose them. Expose them. Take no part in the unfruitful light works of darkness, but instead expose them. Now notice what he said, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but expose them, not the people, expose the sin. Expose the unfruitful works, not the person, but the work of darkness itself by shining your light, by being the light you've been called to be. Expose the works of darkness by the light that is in you because of Jesus. We all do a good job of exposing ourselves and others don't need our help exposing themselves. They are already exposed. And we already are already exposed when we are in error. It's important to remember, God loves the sinner, hates the sin. Always remember that. We're exposing darkness. So how do we do this properly? Well, there's a couple of scriptures that advise us as a church how we handle exposing darkness, how we expose disobedience in the church, how we practice church discipline, if you will. Okay? Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. You don't have to turn there, but if you want to, go ahead, take note, that, read it later. But this is what it says. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Lovingly, just between you and I. Look, I know you're having trouble with this. You want to know how I know? Because I had trouble with it too. But because of what Jesus has done for me, I can help you overcome. Or look, he offended me long ago. I see something different in you now. I want to set this right. Okay? If they listen to you, this is right from Scripture, if they listen to you, you've won them over. It's done. It's over. It's in the past. But if they won't listen, take one or two others along so that Every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That way, if you go by yourself, they reject your word, you go back with a couple other people to try to lovingly, lovingly restore this brother or sister in error. Okay? If they won't listen, then it's not just your word against them. Okay? If they still refuse to listen, when you've taken a group and you've said, look, we love you. We want, we, we want the best for you. That's why we're here. Okay. If they refuse to listen to you, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to you, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, 
Truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. That's probably the scripture that is most used out of context in all of the Bible. People all the time will meet in a prayer meeting and say, well, when the two or three of us are gathered, I will be with you there also. As Jesus is always with us. He's talking about, I've got your back in matters of discipline. I'm there with you. You're doing the right thing because I commanded it. I said it. Now, the other scripture that comes to mind is 2 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 through 11. This is when a brother has went through the discipline process, and now it's time to restore. If anyone has caused grief, Paul says, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority, that would be us, is sufficient. He was cast out of the church. He was turned over to Satan. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not aware of his schemes. Now that whole section from Matthew of Jesus talking and then Paul uh, addressing the church in Corinth in the second letter, that was a follow-up to someone they had cast out of the church because of incest. And then Paul says, you're to restore this brother since he has went through the process and has repented. Now in verse 12 of our text, carries on with this idea, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. This is a no taking part in the work of darkness. This is an extension of it. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Now my first reaction to that verse was, well, why shouldn't we speak about those things of darkness? I thought, would it hurt my virgin saintly ears if I were to talk about it? No. It wouldn't. No, that is not what the Holy Spirit is telling us through the Apostle Paul's pen. He knows us better than that. The Holy Spirit knows what we struggle with. He knows what we're drawn to do. He knows that we react with a knee jerk. Okay, we're not, we're not patient. We want it solved now. We react because we're mad. We want justice. He knows us. But people don't sin in secret anymore in our culture, do they? They don't. We live in a different time. It seems like there's nothing sacred anymore. The Holy Spirit is guarding our hearts when he tells us don't speak of the things that they do in secret. He's guarding our hearts in two ways. First, by not speaking about it, we are not letting it manifest in our minds and our hearts. This is, a, this is a disciplined act on our part. For us to restrain to talk about it, it's not becoming something we're dwelling on. Okay? We have other things that we are to occupy our minds with and our time with. Meditating on God's Word would be a great idea. Second, we don't need to gossip about who's sleeping with who, for example. We already know it. It's not even been done in secret anymore. So we don't, we don't do any good whenever we gossip about it. We, whenever we do that, we find ourselves right in the cesspool of sin ourselves. We've joined into the darkness. We haven't exposed anything except the darkness in ourselves. 
we can do no good thing by repeating gossip. But preacher, he said, Alan, you just gave us the formula for church discipline. We're supposed to go and confront. Church discipline is to be done with the utmost dignity, privacy, privacy, and the purpose of restoring the fallen brother at the end of the process. God judges, not us. Confrontation involves judgment, but not condemnation. Do you understand? When we we're not, we're not tolerating something, but we're not condemning either, okay? God has that authority. Did you know the, notice the progression of church discipline? It was very purposeful, wasn't it? Someone is in error, you go. You go and confront that brother or sister and try to lovingly restore them. If they won't listen to you, two or three of you go. Take a couple of elders with you. Last resort, it's brought before the church. Why do you suppose it's last resort? Anyone? Well, you don't want to lose them. You no, you, we, do. we don't want to lose them. You want to do everything you possibly can. Well, why didn't we do that in the first place? Why didn't, why didn't we bring him in front of the whole church? You know, let's say Jill's done something against me. Instead of me going to her and confront her, why don't I just bring her up here in front of the church and say, Church, guess what Jill did to me? And she won't repent. The harder the group, the less, less personal it is, and the more confrontational it is. That's correct. Okay? That is correct. Even whenever the sin is brought before the church, it should stay within the boundaries of the loving fellowship of believers. We are absolutely not to go out in public with a badge of honor proclaiming that we have restored the fallen brother or that we have practiced church discipline and why we did it. Who are we to run our mouths about someone else's sin issue? Now, enough said about that. Verses 13 and 14. Look back at that. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible of light is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Notice the effect of what is exposed. It becomes light. If it's exposed, it's seen. It becomes light. It has the opportunity to come out of darkness. I mean, this is just really an extension of the light talk that we had last week, all that discussion about light. And verse 14 really is just likely an early church hymn. But... The next verse talks about a contrast between the unwise and the wise. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. It seems pretty simple. Again, we have a a metaphor of walk, meaning our lives, okay? But if Jesus is the light, if he is the source of wisdom, the wise, after salvation, because of Jesus, if he is the source of wisdom, and he is, light will give illumination. And this isn't just a play on words. This is very real. All one needs to do is realize the truth about the light, if you have a question about the truth of the light, just read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you won't have any question about light anymore. If you don't understand the analogy, read the Gospels. The wisdom and knowledge of the light is right there for anyone to read, understand, and apply to your lives. It was not secret or hidden. 
The Gnostics claim to have some, some secret information, this secret knowledge. That's what Gnostics mean. That's what the word Gnosto means. It means hidden. Okay? They had some special knowledge that wasn't given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they led tons of people astray. This same thing's going on today. Watchtower. They have secret wisdom. Jehovah's Witness. It's the same way with, it, with Mormons. They have secret wisdom. Why aren't people allowed into their temples to, to understand Mormonism? Why do you have to go through the process? Why are they so secretive? With Jesus, nothing was secret or hidden. He even gave testimony to that, to the Pharisees. One of them struck me. One of them struck him. And, and he turned and said, if I've, if I've said anything wrong, why do you strike me? I never, I never hid anything in the temple courts. I was out there teaching in front of all of you. Those that are wise are those that are finding the light. That's who the wise are. Those that are finding the light, that are looking for the light, are seeking light and truth. The unwise are those that want to hide in darkness. Remember, last week we were ourselves described as darkness before our lives were changed by Christ. Those people are still in darkness, will continue to change if they find the light, if they see the light in us, just like us, we will continue to change as we mature through the sanctification process. Well, that's, a, that's a big $5 word, sanctification. Does anyone know what it means? It's used in Scripture quite a bit. What does sanctification mean? It occurs after salvation. Sank. Somebody, while well, I'm writing. Somebody said something. Huh? Change. Change? Absolutely. Until the day we die. The Holy Spirit is working in us to change us. Change us what? To change us to be righteous. To change us to be holy. That's the sanctification process. Okay? Remember, Jesus died so that we might be holy, so that we might be set apart, so that we might be made righteous. We are not holy. We are not righteous. It's imputed to us. Because of Christ, we get to participate in the divine nature. I want to help you understand holy a little bit. Now, let me get to that. Verse 16. Verse 16. Look carefully then how you walk, not as wise but as unwise. And verse 16 say, says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Anybody have a good definition of the evil? I, I've read a lot this week about evil and the excuse that people use or the question that so many people have how can there be a loving God when there's so much evil in the world if there's a God why does he let bad things happen anybody tell me what evil is listen you, you folks are smart I don't want to stand up here all day. What is evil? Say the absence of good. The absence of good. That's a good definition. Very basic, very true. That's, that's a, I would say, a description of evil. If we think about evil in a non-adjective form, what do we come up with then? We think of evil as a noun. Satan, sure. Here's, here's, here's a definition of evil. If 
from the Bible. And this defi definitely is, or not from the Bible, from the dictionary. It's definitely how we use the word most of the time. Evil as an adjective. Morally bad. Causing harm or injury to someone. Marked by bad luck or bad events. The full de definition of evil. Morally reprehensible. Arising from actual or imputed bad character or conduct. Inferior. Causing discomfort or repulsion. Offensive. Disagreeable. Causing harm. Marked by misfortune. So I thought about this all week. I have meditated and read Ravi Zacharias till I am dumbfounded. The guy uses words that I have to have a dictionary beside me whenever I read his stuff. But after reading this, I come up with my own definition. Evil is that which is left behind whenever sin has affected what is holy. That which is left behind whenever sin has affected what is holy. Now Christ has made us holy. And we all still have sin in our lives, don't we? We do. So if Christ has made us holy, and we still have sin in our lives, how are we to understand holy? Well, I have news for you. We can't. We are only holy because Christ has imputed his holiness to us. Holy, by definition, means to be set apart. And I always use that. But really... When it comes right down to it, only God is holy. And we can't understand holy because of that. Only God is holy. We are made in the image of God. But we are not made God. We are made in His image. Only Jesus is the begotten Son. And what that means is Jesus is an actual representation of God. He and God are identical in holiness. We are not that. And we were not created as that. But we were made holy by Christ. It's imputed to us. It's totally undeserved. And even described so far as, and I already said this, participating in the divine nature. Why don't we have the proper understanding of holiness? I've already said we're not God. But I heard a good analogy. And I shared it with Roger and Wendy. We were over visiting Roger yesterday. And we got to talking about sin and evil and holiness. Imagine that. How does that come up? I don't know. A preacher must have been there. Anyways, we got to talking about holiness, and this is a good analogy. Let's say that Jill, Jim has bought Jill this beautiful necklace. Surprised her with it. He's saved for months. And he's bought her this beautiful necklace. They talk about it, and they, they kind of admire it all evening, and, and Jill is just, you know, she just loves Jim so much. It's just such a, such a wonderful expression of his love to her. They go to bed. And let's pretend Addison has a little puppy. And that night, the puppy's up playing and grabs Jill's necklace and starts to chew on it and make a mess of it. Well, the next morning, Jim gets up, notices that the puppy has the necklace. Now, I guarantee you the puppy will understand that Jill or Jim and Jill are aggravated because the necklace is mangled. But the puppy won't understand why. That's like us in holiness. We're like, we're like that. We're like the puppy. We understand that something has went wrong. And we're not, it's not what it's supposed to be, but we don't understand why. I think when we get to heaven and we see those 
awesome beings described in the book of Daniel, the book of Isaiah that are going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty will understand holiness. We're not going to understand it then, till then. There isn't any earthly representation except for the life of Christ for us to understand what holiness is. And we're very blessed that we have that representation to follow, that it's recorded for us in these scriptures. That's our light. That's our... What are those things called? Uh, lighthouse. Okay, if we're at sea and we're lost, again, all of us who follow Jesus have that imputed righteousness and been made holy through him. But we have to remember, we have sinned. We have sinned. That's affected the imputed righteousness, the holiness that Christ has given us. And what's left in the wake is evil. It's like Pandora's box. Y'all have heard of Pandora's box, right? Yeah. All have sinned. No one is good. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 17, our last verse this morning. Make the best use of your time because the days are evil. There's evil in the world, and it's not going to stop. If you don't believe me, watch the news. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. There's our last contrast this morning. Before salvation, all we were was foolish. Now we have the opportunity because of the Holy Spirit and because of our ability through Him to understand God's Word, we have the ability to understand. Understand what? God's will. To understand God's will. What is the Lord's will for us? And guess what? We already studied it in the book of Ephesians in chapter 1 when we started off on this long journey that we've been on. Chapter 1, verse 4, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. We don't even know what it means, and that's what God wills for us. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His own will. That's God's will for us, that we be sons. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. His will also was that we know the mystery of His will, which was the church, because of Christ. Christ. To unite all things in Him, things on heaven and things on earth. That's God's will. It's God's will for us to have an inheritance since we've been predestined. An inheritance into heaven that we don't deserve. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of His glory. And we know that is possible because, again, in God's will, He sealed us with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of the inheritance that God wills for us until we acquire possession of it. This is all pretty deep stuff. It's all pretty deep, it's all pretty complicated, but yet it's not. We don't have to understand it all. We don't have to get it all. It's all been done for us. What we have to do, what we have to do is have faith. Faith in the cross. That the work that was needed was done. That it's finished. And now we are recipients of God's grace and co-heirs of the kingdom in heaven through Christ. 
We have to have faith in that. And there may come a time. There may come a time, just like the video maybe you've seen that I saw, of the man being held prisoner by ISIL or ISIS and was forced to renounce his country. I noticed they didn't get into religion with that, which surprised me. All those things he was forced to renounce. Obviously, he read it. You could tell he was reading it. But they cut off his head. That's the world we live in. We have to have faith in the cross. Because there's so much in this world that will cause us to be faithless if we don't work at it. I appreciate every one of you being here this morning. Because that's evidence. That's evidence of good work in your life. You could have been anywhere else. I'm sure Jim and Jill could have slept in real easily. Okay? And so could any of us. But our faith's important to us. We need to come here and fellowship together to be encouraged, to be given some of God's word to challenge us. Now the key is, when we walk out the door, to take all that with us and build upon it. Not only in our lives, but in such a way that the light shines so brightly that other people want to come and be encouraged alongside of us. And we've seen that too. Let's praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that you have given us your word, your promise, that because of what your Son's done for us, and because of the free, free will you gave us to have faith and believe in him, we are going to inherit as co-heirs the kingdom of heaven. Now, Father, we don't understand that, just like we don't understand holiness. But we understand through your word who Jesus was. And Father, we pray this morning that you would make us more like him, less like the flesh that we struggle with, but more like the holiness that he was and is. God, we're so thankful that you've given us the Holy Spirit to guide our lives by, to help us understand the gray areas and to find them black or white. God, in the days ahead, I pray that you would give us strength and courage to stand firm in our faith, to profess Christ in our lives, in our homes, in our workplaces. Father, I'm so thankful that you've just provided each one of us opportunities. And each one of us is probably thinking, Father, of a certain situation or a certain person this week that our mouth just didn't say the words we needed to say. Father, give us a second chance. Give us courage. Press upon our hearts the desire to, to share and love. Father, I thank you for all these saints here this morning. Men and women just like me, Father, who have fallen short. We've sinned, and in the wake of our sin, we've left destruction, confusion, sorrow and pain behind. Those things that are evil. And Father, you've forgiven us of all that. Help us to forgive ourselves. Help us to forgive others who have sinned against us just like you have forgiven us. Father, that's the key to being a peacemaker that you've called us to be, to extend forgiveness <coughs> through compassion and mercy. God, I thank you for these people again. I love them very much. You love them very much. I thank you for the fellowship that we have in this church. It's so very special. The bond that we have in Christ, the bond we have in our community through family and friends. Thank you for blessing us to live in a place like this in this time. You've protected us so greatly 
And we know that protection has come from a high price of freedom that was given by all those who have gone before us. The faith they have in you. God, help us do the same if it's our time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.